Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Commissioner Davis uh, had an a international call. He needed to be on at 10 o'clock, so he'll be in momentarily. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's good to have uh, Judge David Lyles with us, uh, elected official. And at this time, I'll call the Pauling County Board of Commissioners work session to order for July 14th, 2020. Uh, and um, I'd like to remind everybody to turn off their devices. Brian, if you'll bring the list forward. And we're very, very pleased to have Pastor Gene Morehouse from Westside Christian Church to bring us our invocation this morning and, and then lead us into the Pledge of the Flag. Stand if you're able. Hey, please stand. Let's go in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, what are we doing here? We came to encourage our commissioners. We've come to encourage our first responders. The things we see on TV with the vandalism, the looting, and the disrespect for our police officers and emergency workers. Lord, I don't understand all of this, but I know you can bring a peace to our hearts and minds that can pass our understanding of the things around us. We thank you for your love and compassion, for the gift of your son. And we ask that you truly give wisdom and make good choices through our commissioners, through our government, through our leaders. May they find a place that pleases you that they may be pleasing to you and we may find that love of loving one another, doing unto others as we would want them to do unto us. Help us to be that kind of a people here in Paulding County, people that encourage one another, lift one another up, and truly that we can be an example to the whole state of Georgia that they can see in us a joy that comes only through your Son, Jesus Christ. And in his blessed name and our Savior, all God's family said, Amen. Amen. Let's pledge, please. Ready? Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, David, for this opportunity. Pastor Morehouse, thank you so much for being here and for that encouragement and prayer. <clears throat> the minutes uh, for June the 23rd, 2020, the work session minutes and also the board meeting minutes for that date are available for review. Uh, in our Positively Paulding segment this morning, uh, we are going to recognize a team, Paulding, a team member of the year and also the July employee of the month. So let's watch together. Ida Mendez is a 15-year employee with the Paulding County Sheriff's Office. Her primary role is she works in the front reception area, and she's one of the first faces you see when you come to the Sheriff's Office. Uh, one of the coolest things about Miss Ida is that she's one of our interpreters, and so she is a Spanish-speaking uh, interpreter, and she has helped uh, with individuals coming in the lobby needing assistance, and she's also helped with numerous investigations over the course of uh, the past 15 years. Miss I was awarded the Employee of the Month Award for uh, July of 2020, and we're really excited that she received it. Uh, she's very well deserving and uh, just a great person, so we're glad to have her here at the Sheriff's Office as part of Team Pauly. He's a rock star. <laughs> so, I'm going to take the county administrator's privilege, and he's inspired me to create an award every year, beginning with this year. It's the Team Paulding Team Member of the Year. Thank you, Stephen. I can't tell you, with COVID-19, how many hours How many hours Stephen has spent with departments, with our employees, talking with the public, talking with me and the chairman and the commissioners to make us as prepared as possible. He's always there for us. We got to do it. Well, Stephen is the ultimate professional. 
and he's always uh, communicates very well. He works well with all the other departments. Uh, part of his roles that we were discussing is to network, and he's very re well respected in the state of Georgia uh, through GEMA and all the other local EMAs. Uh, he has to work with the cities of Dallas and Hiram, uh, public health hospitals, sheriff's offices, a lot of uh, departments he has to keep on the same page, and uh, he does a very good job doing that. But he also takes care of all the employees in Baldwin County. With COVID being an example, he was able to get all the information out to all the department heads and be able to answer any questions and give them good information. He has resources that he can go to and get reliable information. He always follows up with everybody. He wants to take care of the uh, citizens as well as the employees. So uh, I can't say enough about Stephen. Emergency management is all about building and maintaining positive professional relationships. And that's what he does every single day is he facilitates ways for those conversations to happen so that everybody can get on the same page to make sure that we are meeting our goals to make sure Paulding County is as safe as possible. That's great. Good job, team. And uh, who, How could he deny that son? Look just like him. All right, we have no invited guests today uh, under bid awards. We have uh, item number two is to award a contract to the top ranked respondent, Prime Engineering, in the amount of $52,660,000 for the first uh, phase of the engineering services for the State Route 92 Hiram Sewer Extension. Uh, this will be funded through the uh, Enterprise Funds. Ms. Pollard to report. Uh, good morning. I'm going to take the boring part of this and give Laurie the more um, attractive part of this but um, so we're I'm only going to mention the advertising and the response to the RFQ the selection was primarily made by the water system engineers using a scorecard to focus on the qualifications as well as the price so with that said on April 15th we advertised for four weeks we received responses on May 19th from eight firms and those firms were um, were scored by the water system engineers, so Laurie will give you a little more information about that as well as the project. We were pleasantly surprised to receive eight responses to our request for qualifications uh, during the midst of the coronavirus. Um, people being working from their homes um, and and so uh, we we had quite a, a number of, of good uh, good qualification sets submitted to us um, as Tabitha mentioned we had our engineering staff independently score um, and and come up with the final evaluation of the of the firms um, and we also had provided a set of the qualifications to the city of Hiram um, who has been engaged with us since the end of last year um, in trying to identify how to get sewer into the area between Nebo and Hiram City on State Route 92. Uh, that area is has got uh, issues with septic systems. It's generally a commercial area, and it is it is impacting those properties tremendously at this point. So, um, been working with with the city manager, um, and the mayor has been very supportive of us um, of us pursuing some grant funding for this project. The first phase of, of this project is a preliminary engineering report, and it is um, in support for the grant application. Uh, that we will be assisted by Northwest Georgia Regional Commission in pulling that together. Uh, we have been working with them since the beginning to make sure that our selection process, our evaluation processes are consistent with those grant requirements. So we are, um, we are in, the, in the coming to you with a recommendation for our top ranked firm, which is Prime Engineering in Atlanta. Uh, they have done work for on the private side uh, here in Paulding, um, and it's a highly qualified uh, team of engineers. During this preliminary engineering, it is not just a paper review of information and development of a plan. 
There is field verification. There, we're going to have some geotechnical time uh, as well as environmental time in the field to make sure that what, as the estimates of project cost are developed, they are they're, they're, we don't have surprises down the road. Uh, when the grant funding is established, it is established. And it's not any increases above that would be our responsibility, our local responsibility, um, over and above our match. So it's really important for us to make sure that the cost estimates going in are what they need to be um, and accurately represent the, the costs of the project. So we want to make sure things like rock and wetland, any wetlands that, that we need to avoid are identified up front. Um, and, and that's what Prime is doing in their scope. Um, so our recommendation is to proceed with the first phase of this work, uh, which would be the preliminary engineering um, and grant support uh, for a total cost of $52,660. For $52, Thank you, Ms. Ashmore. Any questions or comments? We're good. Thanks for the good backup material you provided for us. Uh, we have two uh, reports from uh, committees and departments this morning. We'll start first with Ms. Deidre Holden. I'm always glad to have her here and present. Um, she is the election supervisor. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to come to you and tell you um, where we are with elections and voter registration for Paulding County. And I'm here to tell you that all is well and very thankful for that. Um, this morning I went through the office um, shouting because uh, we have gone over 120,000 voters as of today. We have 120,222 voters in Paulding County. So I think that's, that, that deserves a hand for all the people who are registering to vote. Very, very pleased with that. So let me tell you where we've been and where we're going. Um, we have survived postponing two elections and combining them into one due to a global pandemic that has effect, affected all of us tremendously. When I walked into this room, this is the first meeting I have attended in months. This was a change for me because I was like, wow, this is weird. Um, but this is the world we live in right now and we can't be too safe. But. Um, I say this because I really appreciate what the pastor said, that Paulding County needs to be a light into the state of Georgia, and I believe that we are all doing a fantastic job at that, and that's because of the leadership that we have, and I appreciate that leadership. So when all everybody else was, was um, working at home, uh, we were here at the election office working, even when this building was closed. And we tried the Team AB thing for a week, and we all had to be back in here April 1st, and we started issuing absentee ballots. So it has been a very long, hard road for us, but we survived it and are better for it. But I wanted to, to let you know that, that because of this massive uh, paper absentee uh, turnout that we had, we had to, you know, bring in extra people, temporary workers. It took an additional 18 people just to get us through this process, and you'll see why in a few minutes. We have faced struggles, um, but there again, stronger because of it. We had to close two of our polling locations, relocate them because of not being allowed into the original polling location. And I want to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Brian Otot, our school superintendent, and our associate uh, superintendent, Clark Maggart. They always step up and help us. We needed schools. They gave us schools for these two emergency locations, and it worked out very well for us. So I'm very appreciative of that. They are truly a, a community partner for us, and we appreciate that. Um, one of our struggles was... PPE. We were all trying to get our hands on PPE because we wanted to make sure that our voters were safe, our poll workers were safe, our staff was safe, and PPE was hard to come by. But I want to thank Tabitha and her staff. They stepped up. They worked with us. They got us what we needed. Um, I want to thank 
Chris Harvey, our state elections director, uh, he, he got us things through GEMA and through FEMA, and we were very well protected, and I'm very thankful for that because we were so afraid with this pandemic that people were just not going to vote, but they proved us wrong, and I'm thankful for it. Um, I want to thank Frank Baker and Scott Green. We are struggling for space, and these two guys are working diligently to help us. This equipment that we have, whew, I know Frank is tired of me saying I need space, but this equipment requires more pieces to make it functional. And we have things out in the hall, we have things on the second floor, but they're working through it with us. And I appreciate y'all for doing that, Frank and Scott. Um, I want to say I, I can't go any further without uh, thanking the staff of the elections office and the board and our county attorney because they have never complained through all of this. This all started for us March the 14th and it has not stopped, but they have sacrificed their families. They have given their Saturdays because we added more Saturday voting. They, they've, you know, been here in circumstances where most people would have just said, I'm not coming in, I'm too afraid of this. Nobody ever did that. And, and they are the perfect picture to me of public servants, and I want to thank y'all for that. Um, we have seen a historical turnout with this primary. Primaries usually don't draw a lot of people. Boy, did they fool us. Um, the Secretary of State, first time in history, decided to mail out everyone in the state of Georgia, every active voter, an absentee application. 6.6 .6 million applications went out. Of that, over 107,000 belonged in this county. Once we got those applications out, the ballots started coming in. Paulding County issued 26,308 ballots for this primary election. Of that, we processed, that came back voted, 18,567. I have never seen that in my tenure of being the election supervisor, but we were so excited. It was like the mail would come every day and there would be three or four trays and we were like, yes! <laughs> and then we were like, oh, by the end of the day, we were like, oh my gosh, we just can't do this. But we survived it. COVID did not slow down our early voters. We voted over 6,000 face to face. And then we had election day. We voted 11,599 people on election day. That is unheard of in this county for a primary election. I was really wanting the one more to make it an even number, but I'll take what we can get. Um, we have seen in this election, we had a 33.51% turnout. If you compare that to the May 2018 election, we had a 13, I'm sorry, a 15.83% turnout. So we had over half turnout more than what we saw in 2018. And this is not going to stop. We have been prepared for, um, from the state telling us that we will probably have three times the turnout for November. So we are trying to prepare for that. Um, we are so thankful that the voters have turned out, that are registering to vote, that are voting. Um, we have done things to get us through this. We have put in extra uh, steps to make this easier for the voter. We, um, we have added an extra Saturday. The state only requires us to have one. We added two. People showed up. Um, we, are, we extended the hours for the last week of voting to 7 p.m. That worked very well. And with a partial grant from federal funds, we were um, able to secure two absentee ballot drop boxes. And those were very well received by the community. We have one in front of City Hall in Hiram, and we have one here at Watson Government Complex. And the last week of elections, they were filling up fast, and we were going and getting them multiple times throughout the day. So that was a, a good convenience for the voters. And we're hoping to add two more before the November election. 
So very, very thankful for that. Um, we did not have any lines uh, that exceeded 20 minute waits on election day. And I know you all saw the headlines. There were some polling locations throughout the state of Georgia that had a six hour wait. And they were also scanning paper ballots the next week. So we were ready to tabulate by seven o'clock on election night. Uh, we did try our system out to see how it would electronically adjudicate the ballots. It went great. It was a slow process, but it went great. So we had all of our results in um, by 10 o'clock. So that was unheard of in the state of Georgia, but, but we did it. Um, we are now preparing for the August 11th runoff, which will be right around the corner. Um, logic and accuracy te testing is happening right now. It will be finished this week and we will begin voting Monday, July the 20th, and we will vote through August the 7th, and that will be here only, eight to five every day. There will be no Saturday voting or any satellite locations. I do wanna tell the voters who are listening to this that if you voted a Republican ballot in the primary, you have to vote a Republican ballot in the runoff. If you voted a Democratic ballot in the primary, you have to vote a Democratic ballot in the runoff. Um, if you voted nonpartisan or you didn't vote at all, you can choose whatever ballot you want. Uh, very limited what's on the ballot. We have one federal runoff and two state uh, Senate seat runoffs. So we have a Republican um, District 31 and Democratic uh, District 30. So we are encouraging our voters, um, if you are elderly, disabled, or one of our UACAVA, which is our uniformed or overseas citizens that got a ballot in the 20, um, the, I'm sorry, the um, June 9th election, you will get a ballot automatically sent to you. If you're just a normal voter, you gotta reapply for one for August the 11th. Um, we are getting ready for November and we are, well on our way we're strategizing trying to avoid long lines uh, trying to encourage people to early vote to once again uh, u utilize the paper ballot system uh, we want to make sure that we have plenty of our ppe because we will be seeing more people come out i've been speaking with um, u.s senator david purdue's office uh, we're trying to secure more funds on a federal level for elections because uh, the county takes a pretty hard hit when it comes to funding elections. And I think the federal government uh, is gonna try to help us out and we appreciate that. Um, also in, in closing, we're trying to get more funds for voter education because voting's not important until it's important. And at that point, usually it's election day and it's too late for us to make any changes. So we're trying to encourage the voters if they're unsure of their registration, if they're unsure of anything, please call us so we can help you and you, your election day will be smooth and easy and successful. Um, we are projecting, as I said before, three times the voters for this November upcoming election. We're um, most likely going to have to um, open another polling location on the south side of Paulding because that area continues to grow. And I don't think we're gonna see it stopping. Um, and we have polling locations down there that have um, close to 10,000 voters assigned to it. And we, we don't want to see them standing in line for hours upon hours. We are also going to open our uh, two satellite locations, which are Burnt Hickory Park and Dying Right Innovation Center for our voters. And we will be adding another Saturday voting. So there'll be two opportunities on Saturday for the voters to vote in November. Uh, the Secretary of State had told us that they would not be doing a, another mass mailing for November, but the public spoke and we got word last week that they will be mailing ballots to our rollover voters. Again, our military overseas citizens, as well as our elderly and disabled. So that's about 9,000 ballots. I do wanna go back and, and say that through what the Secretary of State's office did by mailing those applications and those ballots for this primary, it saved this county in postage alone close to $70,000 that would have had to have come out of our budget. So that was a very good thing for us and I, I appreciate that. 
we will be um, adding more poll workers to help with the lines to help get people to where they need to go uh, voting will start October the 12th that will be here for two weeks and then we'll add the satellites in um, we're going to continue to encourage the voters to vote by mail to early vote so they don't have to worry about those long lines on election day because we will be seeing another historical turnout and I just want to thank the voters of Paulding County because we did have such a successful election in June I'm glad we did not end up on the news that's never a good thing but um, it went really well and I and I say that because you know Jason is is with me most of that day and he's like you're like strangely calm you know what's wrong with you because usually my hair's on fire and I'm going crazy but you know we we used this system in November of 2019 because we were chosen to be a pilot and I'm so thankful for that because I was like man it's so quiet you know I don't know what's going on but I had taken for granted that there was about another 130 counties in this state that was using this system for the first time so they did a good job considering what they have been facing and I do believe that we're going in the right direction with our elections I appreciate all of you for the support you've always given us Tabitha I know I call you saying I gotta have this I gotta do this she's always right there for me and that means more than any of you will ever know I know that you've had your hands full with a budget and a pandemic but you're doing a great job and you always do but that's all I have I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come talk to you if you have any questions I'll be glad to answer them um, but there again I just appreciate all of you you know we all survive this together and we're going to continue to move forward and to be positive and keep going in the right direction Deidre I think you should have been on the news because y'all did such a great job thank you thank you so much we appreciate that yeah Miss Deidre it. it goes without saying I, I know that you uh, y'all did some changes and uh, and I know it was met by some opposition it's unfortunate every time you try to make things better even if you use metrics and everything else yeah. there's still going to be some opposition but you managed it real well and uh, and you uh, I, I like the way that you compromised the position in, in such a way as it it kind of it kind of met everybody's needs and I visited out in front of uh, three of the southmost uh, you know polling positions on election day and everything looks so smooth and uh, I'm just thankful for your work I know that you. You, you take it very personal and uh, and you take your job very personal and I'm thankful for that I think we've got a, a great electoral thank you I, I, when when people want to compliment me for what I do I always say this I have surrounded myself with good people I have a wonderful team and they're the ones who carry this and they're the ones who make me look good and I appreciate that mm -hmm. and I just add Deidre that you uh, are an excellent leader and, and you uh, use your staff your team well along with your volunteers thank and you. that's what makes the difference uh, and, and you're you. very humble like thank you the things you just said thank you so much thank y'all thank you Frank And we have uh, Miss Ann Littman coming to the podium, uh, the Director of Community Development. It's going to give us an update on building permits and inspection update, updates. Thank you. Hopefully I can get the screen back. There we go. Um, Deidre, you're a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> and I hope that the Secretary of State does not trade her to another county to straighten them out, which I'm sure she could. Um, but I'm grateful to be back before you. Um, it's been six months since I did a, a building permit and business license report. Um, most of today's data I'm doing on a fiscal year basis. Um, Happy New Year, Tabitha, and Happy New Year, <laughs> everyone, since July is really our new year. Um, this first slide, let me just make it a little bigger. Um, this is, of course, fiscal year 2020 data. It goes from July of 19 to June of this year. Um, you can see we issued 5,706 permits. That was only about 150 less than last year. And if you look at this chart, you'll see the lowest month was April. In the majority of April, I think all of April, we were closed to the public. We were still issuing permits, um, but we were doing it all electronically. 
Um, every month when I do this, I want to bring you something new. So this is the major permit types issued by month. Um, it's just the, the top five were the trade permits, building master, which is your single family attached and detached, your residential structures, commercial permits, building occupancies, and pools. And I was glad pools made it on here because one of Paulding County's COVID-19 pandemic hobbies was building a pool. <laughs> we doubled the amount of pool permits we issued from fiscal year 2019. And I just, every month I would see them come in and I'd be like, wow, it's like Oprah, you get a pool, you get a pool. Um, <laughs> Inspections. Um, inspections went down a little bit. Um, I think in some instances we were doing inspections during the shutdown, but we did not go into people's private homes. Um, some people had to use a private inspector and we don't track that in our data. This is about 2,000 less inspections than we did the year before. Um, and I'm, I'm going to attribute it to there were less single family permits from the previous year and we probably didn't go into as many homes to do as inspections in the spring. Um, this is looking at the number of permits issued, residential versus non-residential. You can see in this chart that the, the single family is going down, and you can see a slight uptick in the commercial permits. Um, the next slide, this shows the value of the permits, and I think this one's more important. You can see in the past couple years the value of construction of commercial permits versus non-residential permits is equalizing. So I think that's a very good trend that we're seeing. Um, this permit shows, or this slide shows, the number of permits um, based on post, and this to the elections, and um, of course April 1st was census month. The second chart, um, post four, continues to win. There was one month, May, Ron, I'm glad you just walked in. Post one beat post four in May of 2020 in the number of permits issued. Of course <laughs> First time since I've been here. Um, so this, um, Post shows the population growth. In 2010, um, each post had approximately 35,000 people. Uh, let me try to zoom in on this a little bit so I can show you the numbers. So this chart takes the number of permits and projects um, Pauling County household size is about 2.9. Um, so it gives the um, population growth based on each post. And of course, the two biggest were post one, which is probably around 40,000 now. Um, and post four, which is getting close to 50,000 in population. And I estimate, of course, we do the permitting for unincorporated Paulding County and city of Hiram. Um, I don't have Dallas data, but I have looked, and it looks like they've grown by about 1,000 people. So right now, I would estimate our population at 167,000. And if you track that with Deidre's numbers, you break that out. I did a quick calculation. That's about 70%. So I'm going to look and see if 70% of people being over 18 is the norm. And that might give us another way to look at what the population growth has been. Um, little breakdown. This, this, this data changes. It looks more at the year. You'll notice something. This is single family permits issued by subdivision in 2020. You'll notice that something's missing that's been on this list for the past six years, and that's Seven Hills Nature Walk. They are not in the top five of permits um, being issued. The, the top is the private dwelling permits, that it's a permit that's not in the subdivision. And this chart on the side shows the breakdown. It's pretty even between post two and post four, but um, the top two permitting subdivisions are actually in post one. It's Citizen Square, and that's a little different for us, too, because that's a single family attached senior project. And Oakley Point, Pickett's Ridge, which is, of course, where we had our um, filming a couple years ago with that HG, I think it was HGTV show. Um, so I thought it was interesting that the number one permitting subdivision is not on our list. And this build, this chart shows the top builders. And there's not that much change to that. Um, but I will point out that Keystone Communities is a local Paulding County-based builder. Um, switching to our occupational tax certificates or business licenses. Um, right now we have about a little over 3,000 of those and this data just shows how many new and renewals were done throughout the year. Um, this next chart shows the breakdown and this did not change at all hardly from December. We have about 28% commercial and 72% home occupations. Um, one of the charts that's got some new data for us, one of the projects that our business license team worked on when we were um, not hosting people here and working sort of split shift, 
you've heard me mention when I talk about our development ordinance update that we want to convert the zoning ordinance to um, North American industrial classification codes. Well, the ladies in the business license office, they found out the NAICS code for every single business in Paulding County. So we can now give you a breakdown, and I've highlighted the top five categories, which is construction with 25%, retail trade with 13%, administrative and support with 12, other services 11, and professional, technical, and it also adds engineering, but I didn't have room for that <laughs> on there. Those are the top five and they comprise about 70% of our business licenses. Um, NAICS is broken down, it, has, it goes all the way out to a six digit code, so we have the six digit codes for all the businesses. And the top three six digit codes were residential remodelers with 185, landscaping services with 154, and electronic shopping and mail order houses, so that's your e-businesses, with 149. And those three six digit codes together are 15% of our business licenses. And I had hoped, I had shared this with Michael Hughes last week at our meeting, and hopefully next time he comes, he might be able to talk about which of these sectors that we want to see increases in next year. But um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Great job, Ann. I'd, I'd like to get a copy of this. Uh, Certainly. I'll send it to everybody. Post commissioner would too. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. We don't have anyone who's signed up for uh, agenda item public participation. Uh, under the consent agenda, we have consideration of the following item, uh, item number three, which is to approve the request for the conversion of a generalist position to the assistant director in human resources. Uh, that position uh, would be newly established and to adopt a corresponding job description. And our, our county administrator, Frank Baker, is going to fill us in. Well, we don't have to do that. Um, so I, I would just like to ask if anyone would like to move that over to, uh, to uh, the regular agenda. Okay, we'll leave it as a consent agenda, and we uh, know where to find Frank. We have no old business. Uh, we have uh, an elected official, Judge Lyles, who's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is here, and he is a busy man, um, important uh, job, and I would like to uh, ask one of you to, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion that you would uh, move his number seven and number eight new business items um, up to the top. I'll make that motion, Dave. Okay, I got a motion uh, to do that by Commissioner Davis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Caker. All those in favor say aye. 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 So Judge Lyles, come forward and we'll get you completed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members uh, or commissioners, um, Mr. Baker, I uh, wanted, first of all, thank you for the tremendous support that you have given uh, not only the Superior Court judges and our staff, but also the programs, the accountability courts that Judge Bucci and I both run. Uh, we really do appreciate your support in that. Uh, from the beginning, Ms. Pollard, you and your staff are excellent. I don't know how you find time in the day to take care of everybody if anybody has as many problems as we do, uh, <laughs> trying to keep their budget straight. So uh, thank you for your hard work and your flexibility in working with us. It truly is appreciated, uh, and I wanted to take time to do that. Uh, I want to come to you very briefly today. Um, I've got a hearing at 11 o'clock via Zoom, which uh, I have to be on time for. Those things are, uh, are very interesting to work with. Uh, and we're dealing with a lot of new issues as judges, uh, just like all of you are. Um, but I want to start by updating you with the status of our mental health court. As you all are aware, I came before you in 2018 to request funding to start this court. We officially kicked it off in March of 2019. Uh, as of right now, I have four active participants. I have two additional participants who are in uh, in-house therapy right now. Uh, I have three people waiting in the wings to join uh, that we would like to get into our court, but we've had to uh, delay briefly because of restrictions in uh, 
in working on our housing situation. Uh, we have to do home inspections in order to allow them in, and we were not able to do that up until recently. Um, and also, with good news, we are prepared to graduate our first participant next week and all of you will be receiving an invitation to that i hope you'll be able to join us it will be at three o'clock next thursday in the uh, jury assembly room uh, we will be doing it uh, on a limited basis live and in person and also we'll be broadcasting it via zoom and we will send out the information so that anyone can join us virtually uh, to do that but we are very excited um, to do that um, kind of crossing over into the drug court area as well judge Bucci just had his I believe eighth graduation um, we are finally at the point now where our first participants have been in the program long enough to complete all the phases so we hope to have more graduates by the time I come before you again next year um, as you are aware from um, my speaking last year, each of the participants we have has had a dual diagnosis. Um, they have mental health issues. They also have substance abuse issues. And we, are, uh, we have been very successful in dealing with those. Uh, strangely enough, the, pro the biggest problems we've had have been those who are alcohol dependent. Um, we have been more successful to date dealing with uh, drug addiction than we have with alcohol, but we are working on all of those. Um, but each of, the gra each of the participants that I've had to date has had, a, uh, has had a dual diagnosis on that. All of them have had multiple criminal convictions over the past three or four years. I'm happy to report that out of our active participants, not including our graduate who has done all of these things except for the getting married part, three of the four that I currently have are employed steadily. Um, more than half of them have more than one job right now that they are doing. They uh, all have driver's license. They are consistent with their medication. All of them to date have been testing clean. Um, during the uh, pandemic, we have one who is newly married one who has mended uh, relationships with their family. All have been learning life skills, learning how to cope and how to be more productive and breaking the cycle of uh, incarceration that we've had. That is a very small glimpse of the transformation that's gone on and I hope that you can attend next week to hear from uh, our graduate as to the transformation in her life but it is because it is truly remarkable. If she's the only person we graduate from this program, it has been a success in my opinion um, because her transformation is just unbelievable. To that end, on the business side of things, uh, I've come before you today to let you know we were recently awarded a grant in the amount of $108,580. Uh, for program operations during our fiscal year 2020 to 2021 and this grant comes with a required county match the amount of twelve thousand sixty four dollars I am requesting uh, that we use date funds for this match to provide substance abuse counseling drug testing supplies and contract services to address the substance abuse issues with each of, with each of our participants and uh, I would also add that the judges of the Superior Court are at this time recommending that on behalf of Paulding County that the chairman and the Board of Commissioners accept this grant and that uh, Mr. Chairman you be authorized to execute all necessary documents for the mental health court grant. On the drug court side, um, Judge Bucci's drug court has been uh, awarded an a grant in the amount of $232,216. Uh, which would require a matching uh, county uh, or a county match of twenty five thousand eight hundred and two dollars and again the uh, judges of the Superior Court would like to recommend on behalf of Paulding County the chairman and board of commissioners accept this grant and that uh, mr. chairman you be authorized to accept all necessary documents or excuse me, to execute all necessary documents Thank you very much, Judge Lyles, and uh, the, the county attorney has just informed me for the commissioner's uh, uh, awareness that we will vote on that at 2 o'clock this afternoon on those amounts. All so right. are there any other questions of Judge Lyles? Or? 
concerns? Well, I'll, I don't have any questions, Judge, but I will say thank you uh, for the work that you're doing. Uh, that, you know, you and I spoke about the, mental, the need for the mental health court. Um, I think it was before you were a judge and before I was a commissioner. Um, it's been a while, uh, and it's very exciting to see the positive results in the transformation. And I've seen that firsthand with the graduates of the drug court. And um, you and Judge Bucci are, in the efforts and the efforts of those around you in these programs are making a real difference in the lives of people and lives of families in our community while also helping to um, resolve a, a circle of um, um, imprisonment and, and, and court court cases and so it's a it's it's a it's a real win all the way around and I'm I'm thrilled that that we've got these programs in our county truly yeah. thank you and I, I will echo what miss Holden said earlier I, I think the large success of both my program and I think judge Bucci would agree with his program are due to the uh, the outstanding work of our coordinators and the staff that we have surrounding us. I know, some good leaders deflect to the people around them. I know, but yeah. I, <laughs> we do appreciate all the work. It's, it's great. I just want to uh, say thank you. If you haven't been to a drug court graduation um, and the first mental health graduation, you need to go. It, it, I mean, it really pulls your heartstrings and you want to just get up there and hug all those people that are going through it. They tell great stories. They've gone through a lot. They're going through a lot. But still, they keep, they keep going. And thank you to you, um, D uh, Judge Bucci, and your staff, because you're doing a great job at this. And Paulding County definitely needs it. Thank you. It really reinstates these people into society where they can be productive citizens. And it, it's just wonderful. Transformation is amazing. It really is. And thank you all for your support. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, David. All right. Appreciate thank you all. And now we'll go back up to uh, item number four, new business number four, action to approve the recommendation for a memorandum of agreement with Condrine Associates Incorporated and authorize the chairman to sign all necessary documents related to the execution of the MOA. Mr. Baker to report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, really going to talk about an oil change. Uh, we all, from time to time, have to go in and have our vehicles um, serviced and have an oil change as preventative maintenance. So really what this agenda item is, is preventative maintenance. It's a request for a MOA, memorandum of agreement, uh, to conduct a classification and, and compensation uh, study. Um, this is really a tune-up from a study that was done in 16, um, that was completed, I think we started in, si or actually started before 16 in the development of this. Uh, what is significant about uh, 2016 is that we had not had a classification study for nearly 18 years prior to 16. So this was a major thing for the county to do, to get up, up to date and up to speed on what we needed to, uh, to do uh, for our employees um, to make, it, make sure that we were where we needed to be. Uh, so there was a commitment made several years ago to do this classification study. But to continue to make it important and viable and something that you move forward with, uh, you have to do updates. You've got to do preventative maintenance. And part of that commitment is a continuation um, and a tune-up every four to five years. And so we're, in, when that, we're within that window of time right now where we need to take a look at this. And that's what we're requesting to do. So this is a, a study that would begin uh, August 1st and would continue uh, until the end of, of November. The cost of the study is uh, $37,000, or I'm sorry, $39,750. Um, the addition, the original study that was done in 16, that was inactive in 16, that was done prior to 16, uh, was a lot more money. Uh, this is going to be done by the same firm that conducted the original study that we did. And based on that, there's a lot of housekeeping that's already been done um, that they don't have to, to go in and look at. So it's going to take a lot less time uh, to be able to complete this, and we should have an evaluation back if the board approves this um, sometime at the end of the year. Uh, or at the beginning of, uh, of 2021. 
um, be happy to answer any questions. And actually, we have uh, a couple representatives from HR here today. Also, uh, if um, if we need any uh, any uh, information from them, I, I know they were both involved in this uh, back in the day uh, when we uh, when we did it in, in uh, 15 and 16. Any questions for Mr. Baker? Thanks so much, Frank. Uh, Thank new, you, Mr. Chairman. New business number five is discuss action to approve the purchase of Kubota membranes in the amount of $692,438 for the replacement of existing membranes at the county's wastewater treatment plants. Um, and this will be funded by the enterprise funds. Ms. Ashmore. Okay. Um, following along on the theme of preventive maintenance, uh, the the uh, it, this is you, the county has really stringent discharge requirements from its wastewater treatment plants that have driven the the treatment plants it themselves to utilize membrane bio bioreactor technology. Um, and so we are, um, and between the plants, we have a total of 31,600 membranes. They typically have about a 10-year lifespan. Um, we have had some issues, though, some, har some really hard use. Um, and you've got some photos um, that, that I've shared with you from, from our wastewater operations staff. Um, the, the plants that have band screens on them pass a lot of material, a lot of fine material, uh, and there's a lot of buildup of that material on the membranes. And there are, there's oil and grease buildup that, you, that you'll see on, on those photos. Um, it is, um, and, and so it, that, that's, that's really hard use. Um, and so it, it is, we, we've got some of those, and then we've got also, we have replaced band screens at Coppermine and put in rotary drum screens, uh, which are doing a much better job of, of uh, removing material as, it, as the wastewater enters the plant. And, uh, and you can see a photo of the difference of what the membranes look like at that facility now with the replacement of those membranes. We're requesting 2,100 membranes at Coppermine um, and to complete the uh, replacement of those membranes. 2,400 are projected to be used at the upper Sweetwater plant. Those membranes have actually lasted us longer. They've lasted us about 15 years. Um, and, and that plant has received less than its design flow over those years. So a much lighter use on, on those membranes has allowed us to, uh, to utilize those for 15 years. And then 2,800 will be used to replace bro broken membranes at the pumpkin bind plant. Um, and, and so it, the and also all told, we're we're requesting the purchase of 7,300 membranes. They are there are different size membranes in use at the different facilities. So you see you, you see the difference in the the quotation on those. Uh, but we're requesting your approval for purchase of Kubota membranes in the amount of $692,438 for these replacement membranes. Um, and I will tell you, tell you that those membranes have been replaced by staff. We put a, together a team of people. We rent a crane. And all of that work is, is done um, with county labor. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for the pictures. Worth a thousand words, right? Any questions? Thank you, Lori. New business number six is discuss action to approve and authorize the chairman to execute consent uh, order uh, for the construction activity at Richland Creek Reservoir under permit number GAR 151687. Ms. Ashmore will also present. Okay. Permit coverage for Richland Creek's 
stormwater discharges, otherwise known as erosion and sedimentation control, um, were issued jointly. Uh, well, it's a federal federal law administrated uh, and permits issued by the state of Georgia regulating this uh, this project. It was the permit was written in the name of our contractor. Um, Brad Cole Construction and Paulding County as the property owner um, as co-permittees. The um, Paulding County in turn um, had contractual relationships with agents to ensure project compliance with this permit. As a co-permittee the state is looking for Brad Cole to implement the requirements of the of the permit and Paulding County as the co-permittee to ensure that that these um, that all the requirements were made state inspections had determined that to some degree that we did not ensure compliance with best management uh, practices um, stabilization and stormwater monitoring was being conducted and reported on, on the required timeline. So as such, the state is issuing two consent orders. Um, Brad Cole Construction has already entered into um, their, co their consent order um, on June 8th and then one to us as co-permittee. Uh, each of those consent order contains a $17,500 penalty. Um, it is, um, an order of magnitude less than what uh, could be imposed. The um, so we're requesting the um, that the board authorize the chairman to execute that consent order. I want to call for questions, concerns. Uh, another thank you for the backup material. And the availability to talk with you on the phone yesterday. Okay, we had Judge Lyles for new business number seven and eight. I would just ask our county clerk if there's any need for me to read those since he has already presented. Okay. Uh, new business number seven that, again, Judge Lyles presented was discuss action to approve the Superior Court Judge's recommendation to accept the mental health accountability a court grant and to authorize the chairman to execute all necessary documents associated with that grant which he stated as a hundred and eight thousand dollars a hundred and eight thousand five hundred and eight dollars and new business number eight was discuss action to approve superior court judges recommendation to accept the felony drug accountability court grant and to authorize the chairman to execute all necessary documents associated with the grant and that was $232,216 was the grant. The match for the, uh, the first one was $12,064 and the match for the Felony Drug Accountability Court was $25,802. Right now we'll move to, and save the best for last, uh, the new business number nine which is discuss action to approve the chairman's nomination of Tara Palmer to the position of Human Resources Director. And myself and Mr. Baker, I want to say a few words. I, uh, I can tell you that um, Tara Palmer was born and raised here. And I remember Ashley went to East Pauling High School. Did you also go to East Pauling High School? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it shows how old I am. That's where my kids went. I think probably classmates. Miss um, <laughs> um, Palmer has given Pauling County 19 years of her service already. She's blessed to be married to Jody Palmer, the uh, Hiram City uh, Manager. Uh, she is a certified safety coordinator uh, for the Board of Commissioners. She has uh, done work with a safety program for our 850 plus employees uh, over the years. Um, and she's handled workman's comps claims. Uh, she's represented Pauling County uh, during 
uh, multiple un uh, unemployment hearings. Uh, everybody who knows her loves her, and she's got a great attitude, uh, and she's got some great ideas for the Human Resources Department. Uh, Mr. Baker and Commissioner Caker and I were able to uh, interview uh, several people, five to be exact, and Ms. Palmer was chosen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of the, uh, the interview process. Um, I've known uh, Tara now for a while, because uh, I've been with Paulding County nearly eight years. Uh, most of it, of course, has been with the court system. So I, was, I know exactly where Judge Lyles is coming from when he was talking about the accountability courts. But um, as I've known Tara, uh, I think I've probably experienced with her just about every HR function there is in the eight years, whether it's uh, training, whether it's um, you know, salary issues, or just the day-to-day -day operational things. And I will just tell everyone that over the last uh, three years since I've been county administrator, uh, that's continued uh, since since I've been in the court system. And to go a little bit further, uh, in the last couple of months, uh, she she and the staff over there have just done a tremendous job. We, we had a major conversion um, over to a, uh, a different insurance uh, situation that we were, were doing. It was a lot of work. And um, uh, Tara and the folks over there did, so, did such a great job. And in fact, I, I talked to somebody last week, and he said, can I come to the, the meeting and support um, the afternoon session uh, and it uh, was one of the parties that was um, working with Tara and staff uh, on that conversion that we did so uh, my kudos to her she's done a tremendous job uh, for the county uh, and I think this is a, an excellent uh, choice and excellent nomination and I appreciate you allowing me to give my two cents worth thank you thank you Frank any questions concerns comments Well, that is the conclusion of our regular business today. Um, we have been concluding our meetings, uh, allowing the commissioners uh, to make any comments or announcements that's on their mind, heart. And we usually start down at the right here, so we're going to move over to Commissioner Stover to provide us with whatever wisdom he has on his mind. I just want to thank uh, Gary and uh, his staff Public safety, Jody, uh, Joey, going through all this with everything that is going on, and um, this county, this community does have a lot of support for public safety, and uh, I'm proud to be part of it. You know, I've always worked for myself most of my life, and I like to surround myself with good people to work with. Also, and like Deidre said, it makes a big difference. So. Uh, and most, uh, every department head here has done the same in Mid's County. He's got a lot of great employees, and uh, I've got, to, I knew a lot of them before, but I've got to know a lot of them, a lot more of them since, and I'm just really proud to be a, from Paulding County, so thank y'all. You got mine? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, I want to, I just want to, I want to draw the spotlight to one person or one department, and it's uh, the Marshals Department. I know that through this COVID situation that they've had to maintain their same workload along with this building stuff. And, guys, I mean, I wish I could just call everybody out by name, but, but in this particular case, I definitely, uh, Trevor Hess, is, uh, he shows leadership, and uh, that whole bunch, they just they get on things uh, whenever we need them, regardless of what we need, and they get us answers and get over there and, and get things back to us. I, I love the responses I get from the Marshals Department, and I am thankful that they have uh, taken on this thing of, of our building security. Uh, because this COVID thing, I mean, we're we're all entering this this uncharted waters, but but I know that they've been uh, big in, in implementing all the safety precautions that we have in place. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you, Chuck. Well, let's move down to the far end here. We'll go with Ron and come back this way. You're just mixing it up all over the place today, Dave. <laughs> So I have had a number of people ask me for clarification about um, the state of emergency uh, and the governor's executive order and the governor's the state state of emergency and how all that plays together and when when does stuff end and when can be we be normal and um, and I, I've looked at the 
all the executive orders and the and the emergency declarations and the problem with me doing that is that I'm not an attorney and so I don't know so I called uh, Jason Phillips yesterday uh, and said hey do you think you could give everybody an update during my time slot because um, I would like to know but I know there are other people would like to know if we can get a recap um, because the county order ended and and there, there's a date uh, with the state here this week and um, so if I'd like to just defer my time of giving a comment to the county attorney if that's all right and if Jason you don't mind you could clarify and uh, and then I'll then we'll let Sandy go oh I will try um, all right thank you Ron and thank you for the heads up yesterday uh, just to kind of set out where we are statewide there is a current public health state of emergency declared by the governor uh, and essentially ratified by the General Assembly um, that is set to expire on August 11th, 2020, uh, at 1159 uh, p.m. These state of emergencies, they are authorized under state law for 30-day stints. So as you approach the end of a 30-day period, the governor often renews it, and he's been renewing it ever since uh, March. So our current state of emergency, which is just a general category expires August 11th that general category allows the governor to do things under his emergency powers that he is not normally authorized to do when we are not in an emergency so one of the things that he does during the state of emergency is he passes various executive orders that control uh, how we conduct ourselves the current executive order uh, which was issued June 29th uh, that is set to expire tomorrow at midnight so July 15th at midnight my hunch is that that executive order will there will be a further executive order given the conditions that everybody knows that we are in right now as we've seen on the media and as some of us have experienced firsthand uh, but the current executive order which will expire tomorrow it is 40 pages long so I wanted to highlight some of the requirements of that order. Uh, one of those is social distancing. It is required. We are to refrain from public gatherings. Uh, and the, the definition of public gathering changes from executive order to executive order. Currently, a public gathering is capped. Uh, a public gathering starts at 50. If you have 50, excuse me, 51. If you have 51 people, you're not supposed to meet together unless social distancing of six feet can be maintained. If you're 50 or lower, you're not triggering the public gathering restriction. However, they still highly encourage social distancing and other COVID-19 measures. Shelter in place, it is currently required for high risk persons. Those are ones that are particularly vulnerable, vulnerable for medical uh, reasons. Restaurant, there are restaurants, there are certain restaurant safety protocols. Um, I'm just going to highlight two of them. Mask for workers and group seating, they have to be spaced six feet apart. All right, you don't have to have six feet from one another, but groups that are eating together have to be six feet apart from the uh, next group. That's two of 35 requirements that are put in place in order to operate a restaurant while we're in the current state of emergency and current executive order expiring tomorrow. There are recommendations for critical infrastructure folks, uh, mandatory requirement, requirements for numerous other types of folks like uh, uh, bars, gyms, barbers, healthcare workers, schools, childcare, summer camps, live performance venues. Each of those categories has its own set of mandatory requirements, and those requirements can be anything from 10 to 40 so requirements long. I think most importantly in what you're seeing on the news this week is there is a provision in Governor's Kemp, Governor Kemp's executive order which says that no local emergency order, i.e. something from a board of commissioners, or something from a city council or a mayor or a chairperson 
uh, those local emergency orders cannot be more restrictive than the governor's order. If they are more restrictive, the governor's order says that local order is suspended, nor can uh, the local government lessen the requirement set forth in the governor's order. So if it's more restrictive than the governor's order or less restrictive than the governor's order, the governor's order says that local declaration or local, local provision is suspended. So hopefully in a nutshell, I've, uh, I've answered that. But again, the order's 40 pages long. I've got a copy of it here with me in case anybody wants to take a look at it. I expect, I checked the governor's website this morning. I did not see a new executive order, but I expect one here probably within the next 24 hours. Thank you, Jason. And just to clarify, on the county level, um, uh, everything that we have done related to state of emergency has expired, and we are deferring to the state since that's the group, that's the executive order that would take the precedence anyway. That's correct. And, and Ron, that is a, a question might be asked, well, if the governor's order is going to trump the local order, why did you pass one to begin with? Uh, well, at the time, we passed one to begin with when this whole emergency started. Uh, it wasn't all of a sudden the governor's going to control everything. Uh, local jurisdictions started responding appropriately to what they were seeing locally. And once things stabilized, it became clear uh, what should be allowed to expire and what should continue. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Commissioner Kaker. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I saw on Facebook this morning um, our Paulding County Sheriff's Department is hiring and has hired new deputies. So I want to um, welcome them to Paulding County. I hope we make it a good home for them. And then um, Deidre, we miss you. <laughs> Thank you for always giving us support and inspiration. Thank you, Sandy. You just stole my thunder. <laughs> but I, I would like to announce that I'm very uh, privileged and honored and excited to have been invited to uh, represent Paulding County uh, on the South Lawn at the White House. On Thursday, uh, I'll be one of 10 commissioners uh, to be able to uh, listen and exchange some ideas with uh, President Trump uh, on deregulation. So uh, really looking forward to that and um, I will bring some reports home. So uh, we will move on to executive session. We need a, a motion to go to executive session for personnel, real estate, pending and potential litigation. I'll make that motion, Dave. A motion by Commissioner Davis. Is there a second? Second. Is that you? I second. Okay. Second. Uh, by Commissioner Stover. All those in favor say aye. 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 We stand adjourned for executive session.